10th anniversary uh, memorial for, uh, okay, here it is now. Bukala Saraki is speaking right now to honor Dr. Abubakar Ulushala Saraki. Let's take a listen. All of you here present who gathered in this hall to honor Dr. Uluwe Abubakar Ulushala Saraki, Waziri Lori, may Allah continue to retain him in the place of our Jannah Fidels. We are happy that on a Monday, a very important day for state, corporate, and personal businesses. We've all kept this day aside to be here, left our offices and homes to be with us. We appreciate it, and we don't take it for granted. The choice of today is auspicious. The 10th anniversary of our late father was two weeks ago, and as we are done for many years since his demise, we attend a prayer session in our hometown in Lorin, where Islamic scholars lecture us on his life and enjoy those of us left behind to borrow examples from his activities, philosophy, goals, and aspiration. Part of the anniversary of this time celebration was a medical outreach sponsored by a few of the younger associates. In addition, the family and associates also believe that it is good that as part of the celebration of his life and times, we should create a national platform to address one of the issues that our late father was passionate about as a way of reawakening national consciousness on it and seeking to achieve improvement in the national interest. We know that in his lifetime, any matter that concerned any of Uluwe's numerous followers usually touched him with so much person, personality, passionate, and genuinity. His followers were his life. They formed the core of his politics and well-being. He believed they should have a say in his political decisions, and he never took any action without consulting or briefing them. He never took their loyalty for granted. He believed in the physical, intellectual, spiritual, and material development of his followers. He believed a leader is as good as his followers. It is for this reason that he spent a huge chunk of his resources to give scholarship awards to children of many of his supporters, many he doesn't even know, and help many to set up their businesses across the country. We have chosen the leadership and followership debate as a way of revisiting Uluwe's belief in having a vibrant, enlightened, discerning, loyal, informed, and involved followership who can hold the leadership accountable, responsible, and responsive, as well as take decisions that can guide and guard the teachers, the leaders. We know that it is an electioneering period as we have in our country today Many of our invitees are deeply involved. We do not want any of the events in the Louis Memorial Anniversary to spill into December. Those they need to hold this lecture before November ends, and this is why we're here today. Let us that if my father was around, he would be so proud of the gathering in this hall this morning. He would be so happy the way Nigerians have forgotten our differences to celebrate him. We'll be happy to see the multi-party, non-partisan, purely patriotic, and nationalistic color of this gathering. Oloe truly represented all the political parties and all the various diversities of this great country. He was Mr. Nigeria. He was a bridge across Nigeria who strived to build bridges across national divides at all times. He will be happy that we have all gathered as Nigerians to celebrate a Nigeria statesman. His wide contacts have made it possible that in all families, including ours, we are members of all the big parties, from PDP to APC. And many of our sitters here represent all different parties, but we're here for a common goal, to celebrate a man that has worked to unite this country. It is for that reason that we have decided to ensure this Remembrance Lecture is devoid of partisanship. 
It is simply about our country, Nigeria. We have chosen a guest lecturer who, like our father, is a Pan-Africanist, Professor Patrick Lumumba, who is a celebrated African speaker who speaks truth to power. He is one of the few who represent the conscience of our continent. Many of us here are familiar with him. At the end of the day, many more will appreciate the point from which he takes off and all the issues he addresses. Professor Patrick, you are welcome to this gathering. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we also have a chairman who is a father to all, who as a young army officer in Elori had met and related with that great father, the Sultan of Sokto, His Eminence, Elijah Saad Abaka III. is not just a believer in the unity of our country, but also fought for the oneness of Nigeria, and today remains a symbol of aspiration for a stronger and better Nigeria. These are the goals our father strongly believed in. We also have the dignified presence of the Emir of Kano and the Emir of Ningi, Alaji Yunusa Mohammed Danyaya in this hall. I make special reference to him because he built a special relationship with our late father. He was very, very close to him. The Oloe built strong relationships across the length and breadth of this country. I see people here from the southern part of the country, from the south, south, southeast, southwest, northeast, northwest, north central, who left all what they were doing to be here this morning. We, as children, we thank you. We, as children, have continued to benefit from the relationship that our great father built across and beyond Nigeria because we shall also share those relationships. I believe from this lecture, many who knew our father will relieve the experiences of the type of person he was, the ideals he represented, and the philosophies that he cared about so Those who never met him will have a good picture of his life and times, as well as the goals and inspiration that he lived for. Let me not deviate from my duty, because the people who gave me the responsibility to welcome you all are already looking at me and signaling that I should keep to my time and follow the schedule. I wish all of us a good listening session. I know I am not the guest lecturer, but I would like to just say one thing from my own little experience, whether it's a lecture, or advice, or my observation. As we all journey through this life, some of us are grandfathers, some are fathers and mothers, some are hoping to start families. One thing I've observed in my life is that when you do good, you reap it. You might not reap it, but your children and great-grandchildren will reap it. We have reaped the lawyer's good good. And I think I cannot lecture on leadership and followership, but I can lecture that let us continue to do good because we will reap it. Because we, the children of Ole, we are reaping what he has done in this world. Once again, I thank you, and may Allah be with all of us. Thank you so much. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and I think we can do better with that round of applause for the President of the Eighth Senate. Thank you so very much, sir. Permit me to run through these quick recognitions, Your Excellency, because of time. I recognize your presence, Your Excellency Senator Mohamed Adamwali, or Chairman, Senate Committee on Works, former Governor of Kebbi State, we welcome the Honorable Minister of State Power, Prince J.D. Agba. We recognize your presence, Mr. Tunde Ayeni, Obam Victor Atta, Your Excellency, former Governor of Akwa Ibom State. We also recognize your presence, Your Royal Highness Alhaji Amino Adobayero, the Emir of Kano, the Deputy Whip of the Senate, Distinguished Senator Dr. Aliyu Sabi Abdullahi. We welcome you, and I must also place on record that the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum is leading and representing all the governors here, much as many of them are here. Uh, I'm talking about Rari Tenebo Aminu Waziri Tambwell and the Vice Chairman, uh, Senator Abakar Atiku Bagudu. Let's give all of them a resounding applause, please. Your Excellencies, this event is apt because the man that we are celebrating here posthumously is a man, Senator Abakar Dr. Olushala Seraki, a great man, a bridge builder, a philanthropist, an institute, um, an astute politician, 
a consummate administrator and scholar of a uh, proud scholar of the Islamic faith, a political lion and juggernaut as he is called, a leader, an emperor. His admirers call him a political enigma, the man who single-handedly emancipated the Quara people. He was an emancipator. And William Shakespeare says, and I quote, some are born great, some achieve greatness, while some have greatness enthrusted in them. This actually speaks to the man that we're celebrating here today. Moving on very quickly, with your kind permission, let me recognize just before I move on, the former governor of Katsina State, Barrister Shehu Shema. Your Excellency, you're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. And moving on very quickly at this juncture, Standing by the existing protocol, our special guest of honor, it is my honor and privilege to invite the distinguished chairman of this occasion, His Eminence, Alhaji Mohammedu Saad Abakar, CFR, MNI, the Sultan of Sokoto, for his remarks. Can we give him a resounding applause as he makes his way here to the podium? The distinguished chairman of the occasion, sir. I was Billahi Minashid on the regime. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala nabi al karim. All protocols duly observed, but I must recognize the President, Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, very ably represented by the Governor of Borno State. Other distinguished leaders, especially the governors, past and present, but I must recognize my two governors here, the governor of Sokoto State and the Motawal in Sokoto, and the former governor of Sokoto State, Garkuan Sokoto, Atahiru Bafarawa. And then other governors, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I greet Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. At this morning, we are all gathered for one purpose Nigeria. This morning, we are gathered also to celebrate another person who is, or he was, I can say who is because people die, but their actions, good actions, still remain with them because people still recognize what they have done. We are here to listen to a lecture by another distinguished African. When I was approached by the former Senate President, former Governor of Kwara State, Dr. Bukola Sraki, to take part in this program today and only told me yesterday I'm supposed to be the chairman of this program. And I asked him, what am I going to do as chairman? It's only to sit on a chair and listen to what people are going to talk. But he said, I must speak. We are so interested in what happens in our country because this is a very serious period where we have politics dominating the space. And we are talking about leadership and followership by a distinguished African. So I don't have much to say, and I don't want to take too much of his time to come and listen, to, for him to come up here and talk to us. But like the introductory remarks given by Dr. Saraki, as a young officer in the Nigerian army, as a captain, very young officer, I was in a lorry at Swabi Barracks, and that's the period I came to know Oloye. I wasn't close to him because at his high position, I was just a young officer. But Almighty Allah has his ways of doing things. Because when I got to this position 16 years ago, 
he brought Dr. Bukula Saki very close to me and we have interacted from that time till now. So when he asked me to chair, I said, well, I will come in, but I don't know what to say. He said, I know what to say. And I told him, I will say that I was a young officer. Now I'm an old retired general. Be tired, but not tired. And I believe the topic so chosen by the guest speaker or by the organizers is so apt. Just on Saturday, Saturday, past Saturday, I was in Maiduguri at the Barrier Old Boys Association annual lecture. I was the guest lecturer. And the topic I spoke about was challenges of leadership and governance in Nigeria. That was the Saturday, that was last Saturday, that's what I spoke about. And I brought some copies that I'll distribute to the guests here. And the governor was there, the governor of Borno State, and he spoke a lot about what I said. Now we have another lecturer, a distinguished African, to speak to us on leadership and followership. This is just coincidence, the two lectures coming at this time. But it's important because we are into political activities and we are looking for leaders to steer the ship of state to an excellent destination. So we must look at who a leader should be, what a leader should not be, what we should do as followers to ensure we have a good leader. i am not talk too much about leadership because I've spoken, but I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I want to thank the guest lecturer for coming all the way to talk to us. And I know people are so eager to listen to, listen to what you are going to say because you have been so I won't say brush, so blunt in telling powers that be what should be done as regards to leadership. Because you have always preached on the conscience of the people. And if you have good leaders, you have good followership. If you have bad followership, you have bad leadership. Because we know the importance of pricking people's conscience, telling them what to do and how to do things. Because Sheikh Uthman Danfordio said, conscience is an open wound. Only truth can heal it. So we have to tell our leaders the home truth. Sometimes when we say the truth as it is, some leaders don't feel so good about it. But we'll continue talking to them, we'll continue saying the truth in whatever we do, in whatever we say. And when we do so, they should take such comments as just advice from people who are so concerned about what happens to the people Almighty Allah placed on their care as leaders, so that you discharge and equip yourself most honorably here on earth, because Almighty Allah will ask you when you meet him, what did you do with the leadership I gave you in the world? And you, on, you only must answer. You and you only must answer. Nobody is going to help you to answer any question. So for leaders, I want to urge you to always uphold the truth, be honest enough, be transparent, and be accountable because Almighty Allah will ask you. I wish all of us a most pleasant stay in this auditorium and also listen to a very distinguished lecture and lectures, and I believe we will benefit. And I pray our politicians, so many of them are here, will listen to what Patrick Lumumba is going to say and take some away from this hall to go and use in your campaigns. Campaign honestly. Campaign like a gentleman and then convince people to vote for you. And when you do get the votes, discharge your responsibilities to the best of your ability with the fear of Almighty God, because God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you. So I welcome you all once more the chairman of this program, and I pray for a successful outing and safe trip back to our various destinations. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The remarks of the distinguished chairman of his occasion, His Eminence Muhammadu Saad Abakar, CFR, MNI, the Sultan of Sokoto. Can we please give him another resounding applause? And whilst he was on the podium delivering 
his remarks as a distinguished chairman of his occasion. We also received in our midst the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, His Excellency the Right Honorable Yakubu Dogara. We'd like to welcome you. We also recognize the presence Senator Binta Masi Garba, Chairman, Governing Board, Nigerian Inland Waterways. We recognize you. Senator Matthew Rogide, a Do South Chairman, Senate Committee in Public Accounts, we recognize you already. Senator Gilbert Naji, we'd like to recognize you. We also recognize Senator Solomon Nadokwe, and we also recognize your presence, High Chief Aleo Raymond Dokwesi, Chairman, Da Group of Companies. We thank you so very much for coming. At this juncture, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to fix our gaze on the LED screens and the plasma screens dotted around these auditorium so we can watch and have a glimpse of late Pa Olusha Lasaraki's vision. It's coming via video. Please let's watch. Increase, increase the audio, please. On Wednesday, November 14, 2012, 10 years ago, the incomparable political tactician and strategist, Dr. Abubakar Olushola Saraki, the leader of the Second Republic Senate, took the eternal bow and exited the terrestrial stage in a blaze of glory, defined by his indisputable and famous performances, as well as appreciable accomplishment in politics, a venture that brought him fame. It is an investment in humanity which spanned four different republics, the first, second, third, and fourth, in unbroken succession, and more importantly, he had the opportunity of leading from the front. Saraki, who died at the age of 79, also carved a niche for himself in the field of medicine, business, and a notable act of love of mankind through charity and philanthropy. If you study him, he is naturally a very kind-hearted man, a very kind person. So anybody who studies such character, you find that he takes a lot of pleasure in helping or giving people. He enjoys it very much. And so people can interpret it anyhow for political gains or something. But if you know him very well as a person, he is a very, very pleasant person, generous to a fault. He fed the hungry, he clothed the thinly clad, he built community centers, he built institutions that catered for the downtrodden, and he had a personal relationship and provided welfare to the extent that uh, his home was looked at as the welfare center in Ilorin. Somebody arrived in Ilorin in the night, didn't know where to go. Uh, they said, go to Saraki's house. I still do not know, really, of any politician, of any politician, dead or living, that was as generous, that was as generous as Dr. Abubakar Omusha Vasaraki. He was a wonderfully gifted man. And um, the gift of God upon him, he shared with the people. We used to go every Thursday night. He used to invite quite a few of us to Ilori, where he used to hold gatherings with so many hundreds of associations. He, I know that he was sponsoring hundreds of children to school. He was paying for hundreds to go to hospital. He was pay, feeding hundreds of thousands of people. He's one of the greatest people that I know. If you go back to the East, where I come from, the Southeast, there are a lot of people today, even some now professors, they will come and say, the very first car I bought 
was courtesy that Ojelibu here introduced me to Dr. Abuakalu Sharaki. In you, and he brings, he tries to bring you up. It is an established fact in history that for nearly half a century, Dr. Abubakar Lushola Saraki bestrode the political landscape in Nigeria like a colossus. His influence and clouds penetrated all the nooks and crannies of Nigeria, even though he was the Tsar of politics in Kwara State. His political footprints are still visible everywhere in Nigeria. Saraki's well-documented odyssey reveals that he was born on May 17, 1933. His incursion into politics began in 1964 at the age of 31. When he filed nomination papers for a Lawrence Central seat of the then House of Representatives, he lost at the polls because while he first sought the ticket of the ruling Northern People's Congress (NPC), the NPC decided to return all their members in Parliament. He then contested as an independent candidate, but Saraki was unmoved. Saraki has been a very serious politician and the politician that reached out and expressed, you know, raised his hands and touched the lives of virtually people he doesn't even know. Just by mere fact that you are loved by your people, he loves you and he supported you. The desire to serve the people through politics remained thick in his blood. He harbored no admiration for do or die politics. His was politics without bitterness. Uluya will always tell you, politics or no politics, be honest. And he says, the way he puts it, he says, look, chief, you know that my word is my bond. There is also one beautiful thing about Oloi that people need to know, that he wasn't malicious, that he was always forgiven. His first major political victory came in 1978 when he was elected to represent Ilorin in the Constituent Assembly which ratified the 1979 Constitution. I must say they have done a wonderful good job with the 1979 Constitution. He was the Senate leader at that time. So credit must go to his able leadership in trying to steer the Senate along that path. The sessions of the Constituent Assembly provided opportunity for the then burdened politicians to begin consultations on the formation of political parties. Arguably, Saraki was one of the notable political figures that molded the Second Republic ruling party, the National Party of Nigeria, NPN. He became a Trojan in the NPN. For the first time, he was elected the leader of the whole Senate, not the leader of the party in government. He was elected the leader of the whole Senate. And since that time, there had never been that position given to anybody. He was one of the founders of the NPR. And you know, the usual leadership meeting they used to have every Monday. If a lawyer was not around, President Shagari, President Shagari will not hold the meeting. He will not hold the meeting. Because he knew the contributions of a lawyer. And he knew that whenever a lawyer took a position, most people would go with him. He built people. He supported them. And his desire to come to politics was not to amass wealth. His desire was to distribute wealth. His desire was to build systems and build processes of evolving Nigeria into a nation where everybody had a home and where we will all operate as Nigerians. At the 1979 general election, Saraki contested and won the seat of the Kwara Central Senatorial District. At the dawn of the Second Republic, in October 1979, he emerged without any challenge, the Senate leader. This earned him the cognomen leader until the military took over in December 1983. Saraki was the future 
of where Nigeria is going because of his vision for this country's greatness. You cannot be a great country when you have not yet built a nation. So he was one of the first nation builders. In spite of the beating and the treachery, he still was given. He still wanted to be leader and he died the leader. That is why he's called leader, because he's really a leader. He was a leader of men and women. He never, never failed to ask of his followers. The way he does it is something that marvels the heart. Hardly will you get any person that will be compared on the same level with the Santa Fe Sun with the late Bozero Hilori. Like I said, as a leader, he was a leader's leader. He was always giving leadership. He was always inspiring people to aspire to rise to become whatever they want in life. And because of that, he mentored a lot of people who have become members of houses of assemblies in the country. He had mentored a lot of people who have become members of the National Assembly and held very key positions. People became governor because of his name. And uh, once there is a problem between him and the person he is told, it didn't take him time to bring another person and the people of Kara will also support. So he's a leader by, ex by excellence. He knows how to lead and he holds on to the people that are, you know, his followers and he only supports what is right. He led the, the fight as leader of the Northern Union and some of us who worked with him as uh, assistants uh, succeeded eventually in keeping the constitution as it is today. The day Saraki breathed his last was a date to remember. It was one death like no other. Nobody wanted to hear the seemingly cheerless news. It was saddening in Ilorin and elsewhere in Nigeria. The news of his death sent shivers through the entire Kwara state. Women wept. Everyone who knew him mourned. Everywhere in the country, the news of the death of this charismatic and political titan echoed across the country like a symbol in an empty hall. When I recall that death snatched this great man away from us, he pains me. He really, really pains me. Because this is a time when the leader will have been at his best game. Whenever there is crisis, Uloye is always up and doing. You can be sure, he will not stop until he brings down that crisis. No, they should be praying for their brother on every day basis. He was a great man, a very, very good politician, worthy of emulation. Saraki we have passed on, but uh, he has not passed on completely because he, he left behind a legacy. And this legacy included uh, family members who are presently themselves uh, engaged. If you look at the policies of Kara, not when he was alive, even after his demise, his name continued to shine part of quality because he's a true leader. His was the stuff legends are made of. There is a consensus that the memory of the illustrious political star should be kept alive. His prayers when he was alive was always for his children to grow up and take over some of the responsibilities he was holding. And I am glad that those prayers are being answered by the performances of his children. When, when God has blessed a man, a political leader, in your lifetime, you see your son become a governor. In your lifetime, you see your daughter become a senator. Right? How else can you thank your God? Why are we discussing Saraki today? We are discussing him because of his legacy, because it's an unforgettable legacy, because that legacy, that kindness, 
that generosity is still there with him in his grave. God is rewarding him. May Jannah be his final resting place. He's uh, a wonderful human being, a serious uh, leader that uh, the Kwara people have lost. And this is going to be very difficult to fill that old vacancy again. The country has lost a great political navigator. He called the shot in Kwara State from beginning to when he breathed at his last. Certainly, Senator Abubakar Olushola Saraki died as a political hero. Adieu, Oluye. May his soul rest in peace. Let's have the lights back on. Thank you very, very much. That applause can come even louder, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And perhaps because we haven't shared the health benefits of clapping with you, you might not understand what it is. It's important to clap. We stumbled on a research that was done by the University of Philadelphia, United States of America 2014, that says people who clap vigorously when it's important to clap, live longer, healthier, youthful, wrinkles-free, visit doctors less, and in turn, clapping helps to rejuvenate the internal organs. Please imbibe the culture of clapping. Thank you so very much. And so moving on very quickly, it's my honor and privilege to welcome and recognize the presence of the number four citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabi Amila, CFR, Speaker of the House of Representatives, we welcome you, sir. We also welcome Your Excellency, the Governor of Akwaibom State, Udum Gabriel Emmanuel, and Chairman PDP Presidential Campaign Council, would like to welcome you very profoundly. We recognize your presence, Senator Joy Modi, CON, Senator Abakar Umar Gada, Mohammed Shitu Kabir ON, OON, we welcome you. And of course, Your Royal Highness Al Haji Dr. Aku Obaje, AJ Ofu, Chairman of Local Government Traditional Council, representing His Royal Majesty, the Atta of Igala, at this occasion. We're moving on very quickly to the main theme of this event, which is the memorial lecture. And I therefore want us to please sit tight. This program is being televised live. Thank you very much, Andy. Your Excellencies, all very, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we should um, take that clap one more time so that we are all awakened to the next agenda on the program. Okay. Uh, quickly, I'd like also to recognize that we have with us the former governor of Bochi State, Malam Issa Yuguda. You are welcome, sir. We're moving on, and it's time to listen to speaking the truth to power. This gentleman who is going to address us today has made his name, carved his own niche in the area of speaking truth to power. Your Excellency is very distinguished, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to bring to the podium Professor Patrick Lumumba. Professor P.L.O. Lumumba is a professor of public health, a holder of an LLD Doctor of Laws on the Law of the Sea from the University of Kent, Belgium, Master's of Law degree, and a host a host, I must say, uh, lots of um, honorary degrees of doctors of law, D, oh my God, honoris causa from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana, is a holder of the degree of Doctor of Science, Human Rights at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, University of London in England, Humanitarian Law at the Raoul Wellenberg, Institute of the University of London, Sweden, and on international human, uh, humanitarian law in Geneva, Switzerland. He's an advocate of the high courts of Kenya and Tanganyika, and a certified mediator. He is a fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya, FCPS a fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management and an honorary fellow of the African Academy of Science. 
He is the chairman of Farah Fina Investment Group in Monrovia, Liberia, an economic strategic growth and development initiative for Africa based in Nigeria. He is the immediate former director and chief executive officer of the Kenyan School of Law, a former secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, and a former director of the defunct Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission. He is the founding trustee of the African Institute for Leaders and Leadership and was the founding dean of Kabarak University School of Law, a former lecturer at the University of Nairobi, the United States International University, and wider University USA Nairobi. I can go on and on and read about this proud son of Africa, whom I'm honored to introduce to us. I bring to the microphone our brother, Professor PLO Lumumba. Asante. Just as he's taking over the microphone from Mojima Konjola, Arise Television, courtesy of Prince Nduko Baikbena is also covering this event live. And we welcome you, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me start by recognizing the chief guest, who is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Permit me also to recognize the family of the late Dr. Abubakar Olusala Saraki. And permit me for good order to stand on the protocols already established. Let me say how glad, honored, and privileged I am to be invited to deliver a memorial lecture on the 10th anniversary to commemorate the departure of Dr. Abubakar Olushala Saraki. Any keen student of African politics, and I claim to be such a keen student, would have heard of Dr. Saraki, and I had heard of him before this invitation. I'd also had the honor and privilege of meeting Dr. Bukola Saraki when he was the president of the Senate, and he granted me the opportunity to address the Senate then. That is not to forget that my good friend, Brother Bajamila, also granted me a similar occasion in the House of Representatives. I'm glad to deliver a lecture to memorialize an individual of whom it can be said that he was a colossus who bestrode the Nigerian political terrain and made his contribution in a manner that makes it worthy to be remembered favorably. I say so because there is no shortage of individuals who come and go and their memories are not worth much. We have had the honor and privilege of seeing the snippets of what he did during his lifetime. And if it is true that one is not successful until his successor succeeds, then Dr. Saraki was successful. He was successful because his successors have succeeded and they continue to succeed. If it is true that men and women did are recognized for their positive contribution to society, then it is true that Dr. Saraki was a man worthy of celebration. I'm glad to be in your distinguished presence to deliver a lecture in his memory and to 
have that lecture focus on the critical question of leadership in Africa and the critical question of followership in Africa. And the Africa that I talk about is the post-colonial Africa. The Africa which is now divided into 55 countries with 55 boundaries imposed on her. An Africa which is famous as the cradle of mankind. An Africa which is said to be great in prospect. An Africa about which there is much expectation, but an Africa which continues to punch below her weight. That is the Africa that I will be talking about as I focus on the question of leadership and followership. As I think about that Africa and her leadership and followership, and I think about her often as all of us should, the words of a book that I read as a youngster come to mind. And any one of us who had the opportunity of reading the book A Tale of Two Cities will remember these words. It was the time, the best of times, and the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light and the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and the winter of despair. Those words define the mother continent as we live in her today. Those who commentate about the continent never tire to say that this is a great continent. Those who care about this continent never tire to remember that this continent divided as she is has had many leaders. And when I allow my mind to go down memory lane, I can remember so very vividly the immortal words of many great African leaders on the eve of our regaining our independence. And many of us can see pictures of young Africans, whether in Nigeria or Ghana or Algeria or Kenya or Tanzania, celebrating when we regained our independence. And many of us can remember the words that they spoke and the promises that they made. If it was in Nigeria here, you can remember the immortal words about what they would do to Nigeria of Namdi Aziki, where you can remember those words. You can remember the words of Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa. You can remember the promises he made. You can remember the erudite words of the Saudana of Sokoto, Ahmadu Bello, and the promises he made. And many others, when they spoke then, those who are young, saw in them the similitude of Moses in the Bible. They thought of their leaders and saw their leaders as messiahs. 
who would bedazzle latter-day pharaohs with miracles, who would liberate them from the Egypt of poverty and want, who would cause pillars of fire to stand between them and sorrow and want, who would part the Red Seas of tribalism and ethnicity, who in times of hunger would summon manna and quail from heaven. That is what they thought of their leaders, messiahs. But today, permit me to say, in many African countries they are saying, it was better while we waited. It was better while we waited. There is a sense in which throughout the continent of Africa, there has been disappointment with leaders at all levels. So that when on the eve of independence, we wanted to come home, now that we regained independence, we never tire to see images of our young men and women dying in the Sahara, dying in the Mediterranean Sea, being humiliated at the embassies of the erstwhile colonizers as they seek to leave our countries and the continent. It was better while we waited, they say. Which begs the question, what happened and what is happening? That we have so many individuals who occupy positions of leadership, and yet the biggest deficit is that of leadership in Africa. You know, in 1983, your own countryman, the late Chinua Achebe, wrote a little book we could, which he could well have been writing about Africa, but he focused on Nigeria, the trouble with Nigeria. And Chinua, without mincing words, says the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. Whether you agree or disagree with the Chinua, that is another debate. But he had his perspective. And he was asking a question that we continue to ask about the continent of Africa. Why is it that while on average, 60 years after we regained independence, the 55 countries that constitute the continent of Africa, why is it that we cannot feed ourselves? Why is it that we have no faith in our institutions, we have no faith in our hostels? Why is it that we have no faith in our education systems? Why is it that we have no faith in our abilities. Why is it? Where has the leadership been? Why is it that so many years, while politics becomes the toy that lulls us into a false sense of security, our economies are controlled by people from other civilizations? Why is it? These are uncomfortable questions which we must pose and confront and answer if the mother continent is to realize our potential. Why is it that the mother continent is ever so negatively attractive to other civilizations? You know, as I talk about leadership and as I think about leadership, and I think about lead, what leaders are enjoined to do. I think about this mother continent. And many times, 
I see how our men and women in positions of leadership are being treated by other civilization. And I said, oh God, where are our leaders? When the world congregates under the G7, there are no African leaders there. The best they can do is to invite one or two and beyond the photo opportunity, they are told to go away, and go away they do. When there is a meeting of the G20, it is the same thing. There is no African leader there. And when at the United Nations, they have voted all our countries, France, the United States, China, Russia can come and neutralize all our votes. And I say, where are the leaders in Africa? And as you observe African leadership today, they are summoned by different leaders in the world. If the Japanese do not summon them to Tokyo under UNCTAD, the Indians are summoning them to New Delhi. And if the Indians are not summoning them, the Turks are summoning them. And if the Turks are not summoning them, the Chinese are summoning them. In the next two, year, two weeks, they will have been summoned to the United States of America. Summoned, I use. Africans who are watching this scenario ask, where are our leaders? which begs the question, who is a leader? Is leadership the occupation of office? Is leadership the occupation of the office of the president? Is it the occupation of the office of a senator or a member of parliament? Or the occupation of these high sounding positions which gives us honorifics is that what leadership is? From where I sit, that is pseudo-leadership. From where I sit, leadership is about service. Leadership is about honor and privilege to serve. That is why I still understand the men of old, the men of wisdom who said, he who is greatest amongst you must be your servant. This is what Africa is asking for. And Africa has been asking this question since she regained her independence. You know, when one is talking about leadership in Africa, one must go into history and ask ourselves, what was leadership before we were rudely dis disrupted? We had our traditional rulers. How did they govern? For whose benefit did they govern? They are still there, the traditional rulers. How do they fit in, in the new dispensation? When we regained independence and adopted all these structures from the erstwhile colonizer, what did we expect to deliver? That great American Pan-Africanist Pan John Hendrix Clark says that when Africans regained their independence, not a single one of them re-examined the style of leadership. All of them continued with a mimicry of the leadership that they inherited from the colonizer. And he then delivers this verdict. Not a single African country will ever succeed by mimicry. And I want to submit to you that whether one agrees or disagrees with John Henry Clark, one must look at Africa in order to ask ourselves, what is the state of leadership in Africa? And permit me to run you across the continent of Africa and you will see a continent that is not at ease. The continent is not at ease because the continent is suffering from a deficit of leadership. 
Look at Africa today. Tell me whether we are at ease in Niger. Tell me whether Mali is settled. Tell me whether there is quiet and calm in Chad. Tell me whether Guinea-Bissau is doing well. Tell me whether the Cameroons are stable. Tell me whether Central African Republic is good. Tell me whether Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Northern Mozambique, so and all these countries where there is peace and quiet. Whether the sons and daughters of this country, tell me whether even this great Nigeria is at ease, tell me. The answer is, she is not. And I dare say that as long as Nigeria is not at ease, Africa will never be at ease. If Africa wants to be at ease, Africa, Nigeria must be at ease. She is the largest economy in Africa. She has a population of over nearly 200 million people. One in every African is a Nigerian. She is represented in every sector. If you want the best engineers in the continent, they are Nigerians. If you want the best doctors, they are Nigerians. If you want good lawyers, they are Nigerians. If you want good people, they are Nigerians. But also, if you want Yahoo boys, they are Nigerians. Nigeria is a great country. A friend of mine once told me that if you go to any part of the world and you do not find a Nigeria, leave that place because there is nothing to do there. Nigerians are present everywhere in the world, everywhere in Africa, and Nigeria I'm told is a $500 billion economy. Never ever be proud of that, Nigerians. This is an economy that should at least be a $4 trillion GDP economy. Whenever you reach that level, then I'll say Nigeria is doing the right thing. All the ingredients are there. The question is, why is it that she is not realizing our potential? When we talk about leadership, we must ask ourselves, why is it that despite the best intention of the best of us, we do not get and gain what we desire? You know, I said that when you look at Africa and leadership, you must go back to history. And you ask yourself what the leadership is. And we have looked at Africa that is not at ease. But yet there is a sense in which Africa has had and continues to have men and women of renown. I remember courtesy of history. When Africa was struggling for our independence. I can remember that great meeting in Manchester in the United States of America, the Pan-African meeting. And history tells me that Nigeria was there. She for Bafemi was there in 1945. And I can still remember his words spoken about African unity. I remember that Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah was there. And then we remember how they came back to the continent to lead the continent. And I am still wondering how in those days, without the benefit of the internet, without the benefit of all means of communication that we now have today, that those men and women were able to govern and to galvanize the attention of the continent of Africa for the sake of Africa. They were there throughout. 
But even prior to that, I can still remember another great African talking about leading Africa out of our state, the great South African Pixley Kaisa Kaseme in 1906 in Columbia in the United States of America say, Africa must be regenerated. When all these things happened, there were leaders in Africa at that time and their mandate was cut out for them. Their mandate was to ensure that we broke the colonial chains, and we did. I remember, and many of you here, courtesy of history, will remember many Africans at that time, and if I name them, you will agree with me that they were leaders. How many of you in this assembly will not remember Marcus Garvey and say that he was a leader? How many of you here will not remember Julius Nyerere and not say that he was a leader? How many of you will remember Kaunda, Amilka Cabral, Samora, Moises, Marshall, Agostino, Nato, Namdi, Azikiweta, Bubakar, Tafawa, Balewa, Gamal, Abdel Nasser, and many others and remember that they were leaders who did not want to occupy political space because of material aggrandizement. They denied themselves. I so very fondly remember that when Kenneth David Kaunda left office, it was said of him that the only amount of money he had in his account was the equivalent of $5,000. That is what your current politician eats for breakfast. <laughs> I can remember when Julius Kambarage Nyerere left office after 24 years, the only amount of money that he had in his account was the equivalent of 8,000 United States dollars. That is what your current politician uses for a single visit to a gymnasium. They were leaders who were selfless. They understood that it was an honor and privilege. They sacrificed their lives. They saw their positions of leadership as that of leading their brethren. They did not think that they were superior to the people they led. They thought it was a privilege and that they had the honor and that because they had that honor, then they had to serve their leaders with distinction, with consistency. They were prepared to be questioned. They did not believe that they had the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom. They were leaders because they were servants. You know, I can still remember Julius Kambarage Nyerere speaking on the 6th day of March, 1997 in Accra, Ghana, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the independence of Ghana, under the subject, without unity, Africa has no future. Mwalimu recounts the history of Africa. He says, when we rose up against the colonialists, our agenda was cut out for us. We, the Africans, had been humiliated in our own land. Our people had been denied the opportunity to realize their potential. Our mandate was one, to expel the colonizer. We did our bit, we made our mistakes, but who said we were infallible? This struggle is an intergenerational struggle. The next generation after us had the duty to pick up the baton and to run the next leg. The question is, did that generation pick up the baton? Have they run the leg well? The answer, not as well as they should have. Because we must never make the mistake of assuming that African leaders have done nothing. No, that would be too harsh. I think attempts have been made 
whether in Nigeria or in different parts of Africa, to liberate ourselves from the chains and sorrows of the colonial project. But remember, as Kwame once said, the colonialist never left. He is alive and well. He still wears different masks. And those masks may appear to camouflage him, but they are here. Have you ever wondered why, when the British left their colonies, they created something that they called the Commonwealth of Nations, to which Nigeria belongs. In that Commonwealth of Nations, the head is the British monarch. When the queen dies, the king becomes its head. It is headquartered in London. It is the Commonwealth of Independent and Free Nations. It is not. It is a post-colonial, neo-colonial institution which continues to massage the ego of the erstwhile colonizer as we celebrate. Through such institutions, they continue to control and to manipulate us. And many of us, particularly those of us who have had the advantage of foreign education, we never want to talk ill of bodies such as the Commonwealth. I do. And it's not only the British who did it. The French did it under Francophonie in order to control their former colonies and to make sure that they remain within their sphere of influence, they created a body which is alive and well. In the former French colonies, it's even worse. They even print their currency. The Portuguese did it. So, in as much as African leaders have been trying to ensure that we change the circumstances of our people, there have been external attempts at, at torpedoing those efforts. And Africa and African leadership must be seen in those contexts. There are those in many African countries who have allowed themselves to be acolytes of the neo-colonizers and to the detriment of the continent of Africa. So when we interrogate leadership, we must ask ourselves, how free are our leaders? How free are our politicians from external influence? But that, is that an excuse? No, it cannot be an excuse. Leaders in a multi-ethnic environment must also be different. You know, Nigeria, as Chinua rightly said, like all African countries, is an artificial entity. Chinua says in his book, The Trouble, the Trouble with Nigeria, that there is nothing comparable to how the European nations were created. There is no Nigerian, Chinua Achebe says, in the same way as there is a Danish or a Swedish or a Norwegian. Nigerian, Nigeria is a unique state with many states. The same is true of Kenya. The same is true of Ghana. Nigeria possibly has five, over 500 nations within her. Tanzania, 136. The Democratic Republic of Congo, 306. Kenya, 42. Uganda, 56. In order to be a leader in such countries, those who have the honor and privilege must be men and women who are prepared to ensure that they weld the bonds amongst those people. As Samora Moises Marshall said, if the post-colonial African country is to succeed, the tribe must die. And the tribe must die because if the tribe does not die, 
then the new nation will never thrive. And I did not understand Samora, Moises, Marshall to say that he should stop being a Yoruba. No. I did not understand to say that, uh, him to say that he should stop being a thief or to stop being an Igbo or a Hausa or a Fulani. No. Those are cultural mosaics which when put together make a nation beautiful and strong. But what does, what do we do in most of Africa? We use those cultural differences to divide the people. We use those cultural differences to reinforce centrifugal forces and therefore threaten the very nation which we want to serve. I am telling all of us who are present here and many of you who are present in this assembly who are honored and respected and claim to be leaders that you have a duty to ensure that you are in front in order to serve and not to be served. But ladies and gentlemen, let us also ask ourselves about followership. You know, as a young student, and many of us who are young students, it was the culture when you are in your first year of studies that you must be a revolutionary. And a revolutionary in the style of Karl Marx. And therefore you would say, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but you are chains. All of us were revolutionaries. And we used to say then that the safety of the bourgeois demands that the proletariat be kept in the most profound ignorance. We were revolutionaries. Who is a leader? Is he a leader who allows meta-ignorance to reign supreme amongst the people he or she is leading? Is it the duty of a leader to ensure that he leads men and women who are enlightened? Men and women who can question what he or she is doing? I'm suggesting to us that true and sustainable leadership also requires that you have a followership that is enlightened. A followership that calls you to account. A followership that is going to make demands of you. A followership that when you say that you are going to improve the quality of their food, they do not believe that agriculture stops on that day. But they believe that agriculture must be intensified and that technology must be used. A followership which knows that when you say you are going to deliver heaven on earth, they know that that is merely an advertisement that you are incapable of delivering heaven on earth. A followership that knows that when you are promising to do things within a hundred days, which ordinarily can only be done in five years, they know that you are a liar. A followership that is capable of discerning that when you speak things, there are many variables and it is the duty of a leadership to ensure that such a leadership is indeed created. What do African leaders do? African leaders in many African countries have now assigned the question of education, educating their followers to NGOs and CBOs which are financed by the Americans, which are financed by the Europeans, which are financed by other civilizations. How do you think, how do you imagine that the people of Denmark would have the interest of Nigeria at their heart? How are you satisfied that all those civic education activities that are being undertaken in Borno, in Maiduguri, or in Abeokuta, financed by USID, are meant to be for the benefit of Nigeria. Because the last time I checked, the English used to say, he who pays the piper calls the tune. <laughs> so today, when you look at most of Africa, we have a followership that is tuned from outside. It is not a followership that is tuned from inside. And you wonder why they behave the way they do. They behave the way they do because they are being tuned by other civilizations. 
three years ago, an old friend of mine, now gone to be with the Lord, was engaged in a conversation with me. And I was complaining about the leadership and he told me, I hear you, young man. You're always complaining about leadership in Africa and other parts, but have you ever wondered about the followership? Says you are complaining about the windmill, but do you ever bother about the wind? Is it not the case that the windmill follows the wind? I'm suggesting to you that Africa will never realize our potential as long as the critical mass of our people are immersed in sorrow and want. I am suggesting to you that Africa is not going to grow as long as you who are in positions of leadership has perfect, have perfected the art of appealing to the stomachs rather than the minds of the men and women that you lead. I'm suggesting to you that Africa is not going to realize our potential as long as we continue to conduct the politics of money and money bugs, not the politics of ideas. I'm suggesting to you that Africa is never going to realize our potential as long as we are dividing our people along ethnic lines, I'm suggesting to you. I'm suggesting to you that as long as you who are in positions of honor and privilege are in the business of dividing our people on the basis of religion, Africa is not going to realize our potential. I remember in 1982, I watched a movie about Mahatma Gandhi and I remember that great man saying in one of the scenes in the movie that he remembers one day when somebody who was more enlightened than the other preachers came and he said that on that day he saw that preacher reading from the Muslim Quran on to the Christian Bible, on to the Jewish Torah, on to the Hindu Gita, and on to incantation in African religion as if it did not matter which book was being read as long as God was being worshipped. I look forward to the day when those of you who are in positions of leadership will be able to tell our people wherever they are in Nigeria or Africa that it is not for us to fight for God. If I have a God for whom I have to fight for, that is not a God. The God that I worship fights for me. And if we accept that that is the nature of God that is omnipresent, omniscient, and he knows all, then we are going to unite our people. In other words, I'm saying that if we are going to have a followership that is going to change the continent of Africa, we have got to exercise the ghost of ethnicity. We have got to exercise the ghost of ignorance. We have got to exercise the ghost of poverty. We have got to exercise the ghost of narrow-mindedness. Fellow Africans, fellow Nigerians, it is still true that everything fails and falls on leadership. It is true that we men and women are in unique positions. Abu Bakr or Lusala, Saraki was present on this earth. Like all of us, he had his coming and his going. Today we are gathered here to remember him because as South Sudan's John Garang de Mabior once said, as you walk the journey of life, there are two baskets that you fill by your words and deeds, whether wittingly or unwittingly. 
and the basket of bad deeds. And that at the end of it all, when we weigh those baskets, let it be said of you that the basket of good deeds outweighs the basket of bad deeds. It would appear to me that the late Dr. Saraki's basket of good deeds far outweighs his basket of bad deeds. And that is why we can say without flinching and without equivocation that he was a colossus. That is why you call him fondly by the Monica Oloye. Monday morning to pay homage to him. Now I can see Saraki upstairs through imagination. I can see him asking us who we are present here today. Oh dear Nigerians, it is 10 years since I left you. Where are the leaders? I can see Saraki asking the president of this country, how have you served, Mr. President? I can hear him ask the vice president, how have you served? I can hear him asking the senators, how have you served? I can hear him asking the members of the House of Assembly, how have you served? I can hear him asking the governors, how have you served? As to how they have served, that is not for me to say. It is for them to say. But I can also hear the great Saraki asking the Nigerians, how have you been served? Have they given you food? I can hear him ask. Have they given you fuel? I hear him ask. Have they given you electricity? I hear him ask. As to whether they have been well served, it is not for me to say, it is for them to say. In other words, the great Saraki is asking both leaders and the lead, have you demanded and have you served? And the leadership that I hear him, the great Saraki asking of us, is a leadership where we are united not the unity of the graveyard whose lingua franca is silence. No. It is the unity of those who are seeking to do good. Those who are seeking to do good, those who ask with the firmness that will open the eyes of the leader without inflaming their anger. I can hear it being said. You know, as I conclude, I remember this story, a story that must be known to you, is a story about leadership, which must be contradistinguished from human leadership, is the story of a shepherd, or the story of a poultry farmer, but I'll start with the story of a shepherd. Many of us, from the north are famed for cattle keeping. And when you are driving the cattle uh, through different grazing grounds, the cattle believe that you love them so much because you protect them from the elements, because you protect them from other wild animals. But if the cattle were to know that you are the one who would end up eating them, they would treat you very differently. <laughs> Invariably, they do not know. And therefore, you will continue controlling them the way you do. And you will continue eating them the way you do. But it's a totally different case when you are leading human beings. They are not like cattle. You may lead them in a particular direction. You may think that you have lulled them into a false sense of security. You may think that you have deadened their minds. But always remember that one day, 
If you don't do that which is good and right, day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning, and history has demonstrated that it can come in the twinkling of an eye. History has demonstrated that kings have been toppled. History has demonstrated that presidents have been removed. History has demonstrated that great men have been cut down. History has demonstrated that men can rise when they are misled. History has demonstrated that men are indeed capable of rising up. You know, I always read these words of the American Declaration of Independence because I love them. They apply to humanity. Before America became what it is, they had enlightened men. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and alienable right that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is for this reason that governments are instituted amongst men and that when those governments fail to perform, it is the duty of those people to rise up and to remove such governments. I am submitting to us that we in the continent of Africa, you who have the honor and privilege of serving, you who worked and served under the tutelage of a lawyer today, let us take a solemn vow. Let us take a solemn vow that we are not simply here to memorialize him. We are not simply here to remember the good deeds that he did. We are not simply here to repeat the things that he did, that we have come here to imbibe the spirit of Oloi. We have come here to have a little Saraki in us, so that Saraki, the good politician, Saraki, the philanthropist, Saraki, the servant, Saraki, the doctor, Saraki, the business, can live a little in us so that when we go home, so that when in the month of February, Nigeria will be electing its leaders, it may be said that there was a Saraki and that good men and women rose and good men and women came out to vote and the best men did. God bless you. Another resounding applause for Professor Patrice Lumumba. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Unprecedented stand of stand innovation for you're him. watching the 10th memorial anniversary of Dr. Abubakar Olushola Saraki live from Abuja, and we've just been listening to the keynote address by Kenyan Pan Africanist and activist Patrick Lumumba, and he gave a powerful charge about what is required to transform Africa. He made reference to Pan African leaders of the past who played their roles in exemplary ways, from the likes of Tafawa Baloa in Nigeria to Kenneth Kaunda in Zambia, and he also charged. Nigerian leaders to take notes from these past leaders and the qualities that helped them to move Africa out of imperialism so as to realize Nigeria and Africa's true potential. Now, Dr. Olusha Lassaraki was born on the 17th of May 1933 and died on the 14th of November 2012 and was a Nigerian politician who was a senator in the Nigerian Second Republic from 1979 to 1983. He was also the holder of the chieftaincy title of the Waziri of the Loring Emirate and belonged to the Agoro compound in Agbaji.